Well, welcome. Happy Wednesday to everybody. We are so pleased to have you at another, another commemorative Air Force webinar, and this one's going to be really special. We've got a great treat for you today, we hope, and we apologize about the delay, but uh, you, you can teach old dogs new tricks, and we're learning some new technology here. My name is Nancy McGee. I am the VP of Education for the Commemorative Air Force, and I'm really pleased to have a couple experts with us today. We have Ellie Dana and Elaine Webb, who are experts on the Women Air Service Pilot WASP to talk to you about the journey of the WASP and the contributions that they made in protecting our country. So I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, hang on just a second, let me make my computer play happy here. There we go. So I'm gonna turn it over next to um, Elaine and, and Ellie to talk a little bit about WASP and introduce themselves and then we'll hopefully work behind the scenes to get our special guest on here too. Hi, thanks for joining us for a few minutes of WASP inspiration education while we continue to honor the wonderful WASP and all they have done for our nation. As you know, we do have an intended special guest. She is on the phone. We just have to bring her over so she can appear. This is Nell Mickey Stevenson Bright from the 1943 women class of WASP class number seven. So when you see a designator that says 44W3, it just means that they were in the third class of 1944. And the W is always there as a designator for women. For this presentation, um, all of the research uh, is provided by the WASP squadron historian, Elaine Webb. So you'll be seeing some trading cards, which she did the research and the design for. And I am just providing the narrative. Um, I want to thank you all for being here, and it is a privilege to tell this story one more time. So let's introduce some people. Nancy, next page. There we go. Um, so what you have here is a picture of Avenger Field as the WASP are actually working, and a little uh, slogan, we live in the wind, and the sand, which is what Sweetwater, Texas is out in West Texas, and our eyes are on the stars. Uh, the picture below that is a picture of two training planes, and it is a sunset. Um, and this picture is uh, provided by, to us by the National World War II Wasp Museum, a place that you all could go and visit and enjoy. So let me do a brief history of the Wasp. Uh, Jackie Cochran was the organizer, and she put out uh, an alert in newspapers and told about the program. 25,000 young women applied. 1,830 were accepted. In order to be accepted, you had to be a pilot. The training was in Avenger Field, and of the 1,830, 1,074 actually graduated. They paid for their own way to get there, and they paid to return home. Because they were not part of the military, they were civilian contractors. They ferried aircraft from factories to military bases. They towed targets. They flew test aircraft, um, those that were, had been reported as failing and those that had been repaired. They flew the new airplanes as they came off the production line. So they were in very, very busy. They trained men um, as part of their mission. They did weather missions. They did radio controlled drones. They transported cargo. They freed up 1,074 men to go to combat. In 1976, the military uh, decided that they were going to um, bring on women pilots. And they announced that this would be the first time women had flown military airplanes in the United States. That caused the WASP once more to mobilize because they had been disbanded in 1944 and their records were sealed. So nobody knew, but the WASP knew, and they came forward and mounted an effort 
in in 2002 they were allowed burial in Arlington National Cemetery and in 1909 they were awarded 2009 sorry they were awarded the Congressional Gold Medal they accomplished a lot and we in aviation in the United States owe a debt of gratitude for them because they actually broke the trailblazing path for people to encourage women to become pilots. Nancy, next page. So our special guest. Our special guest on the left, what we have is the front side of Nell's trading card. Uh, you can see that she was called Mickey. She was in class 43, W7. On the right-hand side, what you are seeing is in May of 2018, Nell piloted our Wash Squadron AT-6. She's in the back seat. Once up in the air, she had the controls. When her flight was completed, she signed the inside of the luggage compartment along with every other wasp that we've had fly the plane. So we uh, would like to talk a little bit, next page, Nancy. We'd like to talk a little bit about all the wonderful things that Nell herself did. Now, in her trading card, which I can show you right here, what she did was she always wanted to fly. And she's going to tell you that story when we get there. So she always wanted to fly, and that was her dream. So the reason she became part of the WASP uh, effort was because she uh, wanted to be a pilot. And she did. She flew, a, I don't know if you can see this up close and personal, but there is a long list of all the planes she's flown. And when I said that she was flying in May of 2018, she was in Pecan Plantation and she was 96 years old flying our AT-6. So she's an impressive lady. She is also one of the first stockbrokers, female stockbrokers from Phoenix, Arizona. She is a person who has contributed a lot. She continues to make speeches. She appears at, um, events that recognize women in aviation and on top of all that is she's a great personality so hopefully what we can do now is bring her on board is that true nancy she's still working on getting connected but i will let you know as soon as she's on okay so okay, let's before do we bring now on um how about we have elaine introduce herself next slide um, hi, I'm Elaine Webb. I became acquainted with the WASP when I joined the Dallas-Fort Worth wing of the CAF uh, through an extraordinary woman named Ziggy Hunter. Ziggy was the only civilian pilot training program instructor, that's a mouthful, who had both Army and Navy cadets and then went to Sweetwater to teach WASP. And um, apparently Ziggy's zeal was contagious because I got it really bad. And uh, as historian for the WASP squadron, I have permission to, to spend days and weeks and months and hours and years uh, doing what I like to do. Thanks, I would Elaine. like to say that the WASPs were patriotic women that wanted to fly for many reasons. Maybe a family member was serving, but they all wanted to shorten the war and um, bring their loved ones home. That was their goal. And, and what they did as Ellie said, they did on their own dime and they did it for a future promise that was not fulfilled. They were promised that they would be military and they were not. And I'm sorry, that was just simply wrong. And 
My goal is to keep their history going. Good job. Thanks, Elaine. Thanks for doing that. It's such an important mission. Well, while Leah, who is our magic um, voice of God behind the scenes, working to troubleshoot to get Nell on board, why don't we go ahead and we'll move on with the presentation. And then Leah, if you would jump in when you've got Nell, even if we just get her voice and, and can't get image, then we'll settle, for that, even though we'd like to see her. We've been through a, an hour and a half long practice yesterday and managed to get things to work out. Right, but technology seems to be what it is, and there's some problems there, and so we'll get that going. Um, how about I turn this over to you, Ellie, and we can talk about this screen here. Um, before we start that, let me just tell you a little bit about my background so you know I was a, I was 10 years old when I first saw airplanes up close. My mother was taking flying lessons at a grass strip in Iowa. So I got to fly with her and some of her friends. And when I could barely afford it, I started taking lessons just to prove that I could solo faster than she did. Um, and I could. By 1980, I was able to buy a Mooney 231, low wing, travels 230 knots, uh, turbocharged. And I flew all over the East Coast. Uh, when I relocated to Texas, I gave up flying as a main line and uh, did some um, benefit auctions where every time I had a chance, I'd buy a flight. And of course, I always got to fly because I was a pilot. So I've had the privilege and the pleasure of flying the Goodyear Blimp, a Pitt Special, T-33, an F-100, an R-4D, which is a Navy DC-3, and of course, the F-100 Super Saber, which was really cool. I even had a G-suit. And to top it all off, I actually got to go to Miramar Top Gun. So I've had a really great time. And after re uh, retiring um, from corporate life, I actually found the CAF because I had a visiting pilot um, that I was showing around Dallas. And it, I, I ended up at headquarters and I learned about the Wasp Squadron, which was just forming in uh, late 2016. And I thought, oh, I love this story. And I love it for a lot of reasons because I admire women that are driven and focused. And I can really appreciate that. I am probably the first um, female chief information officer in a Fortune 500 company. So uh, when I saw the story of the women that changed the face of aviation, I think they are to be admired, respected, and never to be forgotten, as Elaine said. So that's a little bit about me. So let me let's talk about them. There, this next slide is showing you Avenger Field, and what's really going on here is that the women participated in training exactly like the men. So they're doing calisthenics. They learned all the rules about flying with military procedures, everything that the men did. And as B. Hey, dude, she was uh, 44W7 said. Follow your dreams. There may be pitfalls along the way, but just pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and continue on your way. It goes back to the point about they were focused and driven, and as Elaine said, they wanted to fly. But there were a few exceptions. So for women, they had to already be pilots. They couldn't just say they wanted to become a pilot. So the requirement was that you be a pilot. As many of them went to the civilian training program uh, to get their certificate, their farm uh, airman certificate, so that they could apply for the WASP. They also had to be 21 years old in the early classes. In the later classes, that age requirement changed. Many of them were already college graduates. So when it came to expenses, men who joined the service became supported by the service. So when it came to expenses, they were paid to arrive at their training base. If they washed out, they were paid to go home. Uh, their military status, if you became a pilot, you were an officer. The women of the Women Air Force Service Pilots were not officers. They were treated as such by many of the men, but they did not have military status. They were not uh, eligible for the GI Bill. So many of the things that come with service, serving in our American military were not available to them. 
many of them went home and started different careers, and some of them stayed in aviation. But these women, focused and driven as they were, were able to carry forth with great careers. They were accepted in some places. Um, some of the men were very accepting and grateful for their contribution. Some played tricks on them and were not terribly accepting. Uh, there also was an issue that Jackie Cochran addressed. One had to do with behavior and uh, appearance, but there was a thing about a decorum and how you behave. So boys could fraternize off base, but girls could not. So how you were accepted and how you were supposed to behave, very different uh, standards and particularly applicable in that era of our culture. As for uniforms, when the WASP trainees first showed up, there were none. And if we could go to the next page, this, next page, yeah. This is, these are the flight suits. They're commonly called zoot suits. You will notice that they do not seem to fit very well. And that is because the Women Air Force Service Pilot trainees all got 44 longs. So these were surplus 44 longs and the WASP trainees had a couple of options. They could just tie them up or they could alter them in their spare time, but they were going to classes from morning until night. So um, until later on when uniforms finally began to be rolled out, this was the attire. Uh, let's move on to the next one, Nancy. Ellie, if I may, the one yes. uh, trainee on the right was uh, Mickey Axton. And Mickey Axton was one of the WASP that uh, flew the B-29. She only yes. flew it for about 25 minutes, but it, it is authenticated that she did fly it. Uh, she yes. had to resign from the WASP program because she, she, her mother could no longer care for her daughter. So she went to uh, work as an engineering test pilot at uh, uh, Boeing in Wichita. Perfect, and here is the, the information that Elaine just sh shared with you is on Mickey Ashton's trading card. And if you look at the back, um, I'm not sure you can see this, but this is a picture of Mickey Axton actually flying in the B-29. Okay, thank you. So on to the next one. Yes. Yes. So here we have a picture. Uh, this is about the squadron. As soon as Nell is able to come in, we'll break off and join her. But let me tell you a little bit about uh, the squadron and our AT-6. So the AT-6, which has the name Nella underneath it, is sitting beside Fifi, the B-29, B-24 squadrons, B-29. And on the left of this slide is Fifi Nella. Fifi Nella is a female gremlin. The design was done by Walt Disney, a company, for the Wasp. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about gremlins if you're not familiar with them. The boy gremlins are bad. They cause trouble. But girl gremlins are good. And they're good. Well, sometimes they make a little puff of wind that goes under the wing. So when you're going down the runway and you're taking off and all of a sudden the right wing lifts up a little bit, that was a female gremlin. Or you get to the end of the runway and you're not quite able to fly, that would be because the female gremlin didn't get underneath and do her job. So they were a little bit playful and a little bit fun, but they were the mascot. And because the mascot of the Wasp Squadron was Thief and Nella, what happened was when we came to talking about our AT-6, our research historian, Elaine Webb, said, well, why not? Fifi Nella. So we call affectionately call our AT6 Nella. 
So now you've learned about female gremlins, and now you know why Nella is Nella. Next page. So when the WASP trainees went to Avenger Field, they went from a PT to a BT to an AT6. You could only graduate if you could demonstrate proficiency in the 600 horsepower AT6. So what I would tell you is, have, having heard this from numerous WASPs, the AT6 was their favorite plane. It was high powered, it was easily maneuverable, it was somewhat temperamental, uh, but it was their favorite. And in this picture, what you see is Jane Doyle at the controls over Oshkosh in July of 2017, which was when the commemorative Air Force accepted this airplane and then assigned it to the WASP squadron. Above in the right hand corner is a picture of our plane at homecoming sitting in front of the uh, WASP Museum hangar. That is the hangar that was in use during the training at Avenger Field. So what I would like you to take away from this is that Jane Doyle was 95 years old when she was con controlling that airplane and having a most wonderful time. Uh, you can't see it in this picture, but she has a smile a mile wide. And if you think back to those pictures I was showing them now, she also had the same kind of smile. So years later, it's still a thrill to fly. I would also like you to take from this the idea that WASP Homecoming at the end of May every year is an event that honors every single WASP, those that are with us still, and those that have passed away. It is a moving experience to be there. And if you have the opportunity, I would encourage you to attend. Next one. So the WASP have flown Nella. We have seven WASPs that we have had the privilege of being in Nella. And what you're seeing in the picture here is their signatures all in the luggage compartment, as you saw Nell signing earlier. So I would like to read their names only because I believe each of them should be recognized. Being in your 90s and climbing into an AT6 is no small task because being in your 30s and climbing into an AT6 is still a big chore. So to Marty Wilde, Jane Doyle, Shirley Chase Cruz, B. Haydu, Nell Bright, Kay Hildebrandt, and Millicent Young, we owe a great sense of appreciation. We also know that this very airplane was by documentation flown by Peggy McCafferty. McCafferty. She flew from Spur, Texas to Plainview, Plainview Texas in two hours and 14 minutes on May 13th, 1944. It's a picture on the right of her logbook. Jane Doyle reported from her logbook that she flew 50 minutes local in April of 44, and B. Haydu flew 35 minutes local in May of 1944. Elaine has recently done some very specific research about who else might have flown the plane. We are reasonably convinced that Nell Bright flew this plane while she was in training. So Elaine, could I ask you to talk why we think this is true? I think it might be interesting to the people that are listening. Well, um, Connie Tanner uh, flew the T6. We know that. And um, Nell was in the same flight. So it's more than likely, since things were done um, alphabetically, that Nell also flew the airplane. But things were shut down at TWU. So um, 
maybe this fall we'll be able to see Nell's logbooks. Um, Elaine, we explain a little bit about TWU and why they're so critically important to the WAS. Uh, they are the archive, official archive of WAS artifacts. Uh, their holdings are are, are enormous, and um, they're still in the process of cataloging donations. For instance, uh, Lillian Yonnelly has donated her photo uh, to uh, TWU. Uh, she took exceptional color photos. Color photos were pretty new at the time. And um, to have those color photos of lost experiences is pretty special. She took the photo, they were not supposed to photograph anything, but she took the photos, sent the, the film to her father to be developed, uh, and he sent her more film. So she continued to photograph a little bit illegitimately. <laughs> a little bit. Um, thank you. Can we move on, Nancy, to the next one? So we talked about Jane Doyle flying in uh, Nella, and here we have Jane Doyle's trading card, a picture of her climbing on. No one flew in the AT-6 without a parachute, and these parachutes were big, bulky. I'm not sure that anyone ever used them, but they were there. And then on the back side of her card, you can see her at 95 years old posing on the wing of Nella. And there's a little bit more about Jane Doyle and the things she accomplished in these trading cards. Next one. So what uh, Elaine did for us here is she accumulated all 16 of our trading cards. And we want to tell you about them because we use them as rewards and recognition. So if you come to one of our educational classes, um, you would get one or more based on your performance in the class. If you take a ride in our airplane, again, um, you would get one of these uh, as an award. So we use them specifically to recognize those people who have played a particular part in uh, carrying forth the message of the WASP and participating in our honoring the WASP. So the cards are about as follows. So the one I was showing you about Avenger Field, and then I flipped it over and was reading about the WASP, uh, that's one. Then we have a PT-13, which shows and talks about primary training. Then the BT, that was the basic training and then our AT-6. Then we have a C-45 expediter, a B-25, and Elaine worked with the Highland, no, not the, Devil Dog Squadron, and we actually are using a picture of the Devil Dog on the back of that card. The B-29 shows Dora and Dee Dee in line with many of the military pilots when they had landed at one site. Um, they were showing off how the B-29 could perform. And um, we also have Rosie the Riveter. The reason for Rosie the Riveter, she wasn't a pilot, but Rosie the Riveter made the airplane. About 70,000 women came to work to support the war effort in build airplanes. So kind of how we tell the story is, Rosie build them, the wasp blew them. Then what we've been able to do over time is create cards for the individual. And I, I don't know that we actually have a selection criteria. Um, we do them when it appears that there's a reason to do so. So we have Beverly Bessemeyer, Shirley Cruz, Ziggy, which who Elaine was talking about, 
Ziggy was not a WASP herself, but she was a WASP instructor. Uh, Kathleen Hildenbrandt, Jane Doyle, Mick, Mickey Axon, who we talked about, who flew the B-29, B. Haydu, and of course, Mel Bright. Okay, next one. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about what Nella does when she's not flying WASP, which she does two other things that are primary. Uh, one, Nella shows up at WASP homecoming. So her priority goes, any WASP wants to fly, that comes first. Number two, we show up at WASP homecoming, and in the fall, we will also be part of the arsenal of democracy, a flyover down the mall in Washington, D.C. But the other thing we do, and we are very grateful to be able to do that, is we participate in the Air Power History Tour. And um, what I would tell you is, what I would tell you is that we are privileged to be part of that tour. We are the AT6. We have, um, we call them sandwich boards, tell the story. And sometimes we have WASP squadron members who come out and tell the story to the visitors to the event. This particular picture is a great picture because this was Nella's first formation fly. And while you cannot see the person, that is, um, Jonathan Oliver, uh, who is piloting the plane in front of Nella, and uh, Richard Mandel, the ops officer for the squadron, is piloting Nella. Okay. The other thing that the squadron does, which um, is terribly important in carrying forth the information about the loss is with the help of our education officer, uh, Sarah Zimmerman, we have a curriculum. And basically, we are following something we can all remember, which is spunky. So self-confidence and positive and unstoppable, um, being nice, don't start a war, being knowledgeable, and be yourself. Uh, don't try to be something that you're not, but do try to be knowledgeable and driven and focused. So what we've done is we've taken those words and turned them into principles, and then we have lesson plans that go with each of these. And we, of course, have examples of WASP um, that have exhibit these characteristics. And furthermore, we have places where you can apply them. We've delivered these classes in small segments uh, at air events. Uh, the one you're looking at a picture in the upper right is a picture of a flight planning exercise, which we can do as a full-blown class. It takes about an hour, or we, it can be done in about maybe 10 minutes in an air event, and it will work for those um, people that are as young as four and as old as 90. It just depends on what uh, age, skill level you're dealing with, you can teach people to flight plan. If someone's four, you ask them where do they want to go, and after they say Disneyland, you ask them how far is it from where they are to how to get there. And that is within their grasp. By the time they're six, you can ask them what would they do if a thunderstorm was in their way. So our exercises are both age and, and length adjustable to help teach the story of the walk. Next one. So I just um, want to ask, because we've had so many questions coming in, where are the trading cards available? Before we get too far, <laughs> we've had lots of people going, where are they, where are they, where are they? So can you guys let us know where they are? Well, Elaine and I had a discussion about this yesterday. We had never um, planned on giving them out other than as recognition and rewards. So we decided yesterday that we would make a plan in case somebody wanted to know how to get them. And what we said was, okay, 
we have funded this or the squadron has funded this ourselves. So how about this? There are 16 cards and it will take us something to do postage and handling. So if you want a set of the cards, you can email us. Um, well, I guess you can't email. You have to mail us to Post Office Box 707, Saratoga, Wyoming, 82331. Send us and that's something chat. we can send that out because it, it might be yes. hard to write that down. So we can email that to everybody so they they know how to get those. Right. Um, another really great question while we're we're taking those is um, someone said I see Fifanella is copyright Walt Disney, and the question is how did Walt Disney get involved in this? I know we get that a lot. It's it's a pretty interesting story that Disney this granted this like sort of one time use deal. Yeah, I, I, Elaine, I don't know the whole background. Do you know any better than I do? Walt Disney was uh, making a movie. Uh, I don't think the movie was ever uh, released, uh, but it was based on a, a book, and the book was written by an RAF pilot. And, and I think it's Walt Disney, um, because, you know, Walt Disney is usually quite cautious with their trademarks. There's actually a letter that I believe the uh, Watts Museum has that is granting the Watts the permission and the right to this uh, Fifi Nella logo, which they did not do with, with any of the other ones. So this is a very special deal. Um, that that they because they were proud of it and they, it was really important. Yes, Leah, I, that is absolutely true. The other thing is, we want to be very clear that all rights to that Fisinello logo belongs today to the Wasp Museum. So we we can give the copyright to Walt Disney. Um, but we don't have the right to put that or use that on anything. It belongs to the museum. So I did want to say one more thing. So what we will do is we will uh, we'll send this out and give you the information. But you can have a whole set of cards for $10 for a donation to the squatter. That's our plan. I think okay, it's only questions? 15 cards, though, Ellie. Okay. A full set. <laughs> I don't want to set, I I don't want to cheat them out of a card. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Um Leah, did you have more questions that we need to address now? Um, I'm looking. Um, one person wanted to make a recommendation um, that there is a book that was just released last week called Women with Silver Wings, the inspiring yeah. true story of the women Air Force Service pilots of World War II um, by Catherine Sharp Landeck. And I think there's actually there's several books that might be something else that we want to send in a follow-up email. Is some, there's some really good resource materials out there. Um, that you guys might be able to to speak to what's out there, um, things that you guys have found to be really helpful, um, and and even organizations that you guys have found helpful along the way in building out this program. You know, I know for instance, um, the Texas Women's University has um, an extensive collection of the historic wasp photos and anytime we we have permission from them to use the photos so we make sure that we give them credit for that wonderful collection of photos from um, Sweetwater. Yes and let me say uh, that there are so many books. One of Elaine's and my favorites is a book called On Final Approach. It's really more of a research story than a, than a, a, a story to read. Uh, but there is no limit to the number of movies, clips, and um, literature that you can turn to. I think Elaine and I could spend a couple of days and put together a, a high-level summary of things that people might be interested in. What do you think, Elaine? I think we could do that. Yeah. You know, you guys mentioned the the women with silver wings. 
And when I was speaking with Nell Bright, she mentioned that her picture is right in the front. So, yes. That so, it's a um, great I have the book, and I'm about one third of the way through it. And I can't wait to get back to it. And I <laughs> think that the P47 that Nell's standing in front of. Yes. Uh, Nancy, if you would take us to the next slide, I, we can address uh, Leah's question. Okay. So what Leah was saying is someone was asking about resources. And what we would like you to know is that you can find all things WASP everywhere. So we talked about the WASP Museum in Sweetwater, Texas. It has historical collections, it has memorabilia, and does the annual homecoming. Texas Women's University, which is the official WASP archive. There's a phenomenal exhibit at the Mighty Eighth Air Force Museum in Ponder, Georgia, which actually has interview videos and artifacts, including um, an interview with Dora Dowie, and she's talking about um, what she was concerned about as she was learning to fly to B-29. EAA has a WASP exhibit in Oshkosh that they're opening this year, maybe. Um, and they have artifacts and a lot of information. Smithsonian Air, uh, Air and Flight Museum also has a WASP exhibit. And then you can go most anywhere um, and you will find little memorials and uh, memorabilia. So Hazel Wicker Store in Boulder, Colorado has pictures of WASP all <laughs> around the store. The SBO in Montrose, Colorado, it has uh, Peggy McCaffrey's uh, logbook. That's where we found it. Lions Air Museum at John Wayne Airport has memorabilia from another WASP. And one of the WASP has been inducted into the South Dakota Hall of Fame. And this is just a representative sample. We also would like to recognize that the 99s, the 99s are kind of an interesting story. Um, in 1929, there were 117 women pilots in the United States. 99 of them signed up and formed an organization, which is why it's called the 99s. The 99s have been very active in keeping track of the WASP, um, coordinating their travels to homecoming, and uh, some of the pictures of Nell Bright that we have that were taken at Pecan Plantation were because the 99s uh, organize them to come to Pecan Plantation on their way to homecoming. There is also Wasp on the Web. There's Wings Across America, which is also on the Web, and the CAF's own RiseAbove.org uh, that you can find on the Web. All of this drives the most wonderful thing that you see on the right-hand side. This is a future pilot. She's aged five. Uh, and this was in October of 2019. She came to Wings Over Dallas and she stood there in her WASP uniform, so incredibly proud and could tell the WASP story. So WASP are everywhere. We had a question, how many women served in the WASP during the war? In the WASP program? 1,074. There were 1,830 that uh, joined the program and 1,074 that graduated. I know you both have had the privilege of meeting a number of different WASP over the years. Do you have any favorite stories that you can recount of, of perhaps something that you heard firsthand from them? Elaine? Uh, one that comes Im immediately to mind is uh, Beverly Biesemeyer, uh, she was flying a B-26 towing a target and uh, there was a new reel installed uh, in, in the aircraft to let out the target and the reel jammed but the motor kept going and started a fire in the tail of her airplane. 
she was a good 10 minutes away from a place to land and uh, made it safely on the ground. But that was her last mission because there was not another airplane for her to fly. Such a good story. There's a, someone has shared the story. I'm very excited to share this story on their behalf. It is Dick from the CAF Minnesota Wing who says that Liz Strophus and Mickey Axton, who were both WASP, were also members of the CAF Minnesota Wing in South St. Paul, Minnesota. And he says that Liz told us that since she never knew where she would end up at night, she always put a cosmetic bag and a pair of high heels in the gun bay so she could dress up when she landed and look more like a woman. I love that story. That's fantastic. <laughs> I think that's a great story. I think the one that goes with it um, was Nell Bright yesterday when we were doing our practice round, which worked really well. Um, she was telling about her interview with Jackie Cochran, and it's very similar to the stories we've heard from all the walks. Jackie wasn't so concerned about their flying skills. She was concerned about their drive and, and whether they were willing to put up with the months and months of training and working from early in the morning till late at night, and at the same time, to always look good and behave properly. And uh, we had the good fortune to interview a flight instructor who was in uh, Avenger Field. And he said that when he first uh, was there, he was instructing the boys. And then one day, Jackie flew in with uh, the general Hapgood and said, uh, they walked around, they left and couldn't have been Two weeks later, the boys were all gone and the girls started showing up. And the um, facility commander was a bachelor. And when Jackie learned that the facility commander was a bachelor, um, he was gone in two days. So there was a lot of restriction about what kind of fraternization and how you had to look good, but you didn't have to you looking good to get involved in any way with any member of the officer's set. So it was really quite um, quite restricted. So you not only had to work hard, but you had to behave. And then yesterday, Elaine asked the story about the bathroom. Would you like to tell that story, Elaine? Oh, I just said it must have been quite a scramble to have uh, two bays, a total of 12 women, sharing one bathroom that had one shower. And apparently it was. Uh, Neil said that if you were modest, you either lost your modesty or you went dirty, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> I think what we would like to do for all of you who attended, Leah, let me just check with you. Um, because we recorded everything yesterday and we do have a video recording, we should within a day or so be able to make that available to everyone that was here. Is that correct? Yeah, that shouldn't be a problem at all. Um, we'll be able to get that edited up pretty quickly. And I apologize. She is just, she's having connectivity issues. And what we're trying to do is get her on a phone so that we can carry her in. So at least we can hear her by phone. And we're having some trouble, trouble there. So we're, we're doing the best we can, even if she can only say hi. But yes, we did record a lot of her history yesterday. Um, so we'll be able to send that out. I also wanted to point out, um, we're getting so many comments from people who are, are, are correcting things and adding things to the presentation today. So I think we have a lot of historians that are, are participating in the webinar today, which is amazing. Um, and I think this is, you know, such an awesome opportunity because for such a long time, this history didn't exist. So, so much of this, even though it happened so long ago, there's still new stuff coming out and people are finding things in the attic and getting stories out of relatives and all kinds of stuff. So this, this type of situation is so great to bring, you know, historians or, and enthusiasts together. So please do 
you know, if, if you have information, um, we would love to hear from you so that we can kind of beef up our own program and also be a resource for other organizations out there that, that are telling this story. Really well said, Leah. Thank you. Uh, I know that we had a question that came in before we started the webinar. It said, I understand that female, Russian female pilots engaged in combat operations during World War II. Were there any recorded incidents of any WASP pilots becoming involved in combat operations? No. The closest they came was before the WASP were organized and Jackie Cochran went to England and uh, studied what, uh, how the women were flying, uh, aiding the uh, RAF. Thank you. And Leah, do we have any other questions that are coming in? Yes. Um, let's see. One question, which is a, a good one. What happened to them afterwards? Were they allowed to still teach military pilots, et cetera? And also, thank you very much. That's from Christy Bade. I will speak to that just quickly before Ellie or Elaine say anything. I know I asked um, Nell yesterday about that. I said that, you know, after the war, were you able to continue flying? And she said, oh, no, there is no opportunities for women in commercial aviation. It just was almost unheard of. And so she went ahead and got married and had a family and then went to work as a stockbroker or she was blazing trails there as well. But she said there were so few opportunities that that a lot of women just had to go and find out what was next. And yet she feels such pride and joy and it was such a delight to speak with because she said she had so much fun doing it and they love flying the big planes. And that was the other piece of it. She, it was kind of a letdown after flying those big aircraft to, to have to go into general aviation. I think uh, we need to kind of step back and kind of look at what was going on. The WASPs were disbanded in December of 44, before the war was over. And as the war was ending, there were pilots coming back, male pilots coming back from the war. And in our culture at that time, jobs went to men before they went to women. So what Nell was saying was there were no opportunities. But we need to, I believe we need to, step back and take a historical look at what was actually going on. What she also said was that if a woman had enough money of her own to start a flying school, she could teach flying, but she had to start her own school because there were no existing opportunities. Anything else you want to add, Elaine? Uh, Anne Baumgartner Carl was one of those that uh, was able to start her own flight school. Uh, she married a uh, Air Force pilot and they had their own flight school and they had a um, Cessna dealership. She was one of those that was unstoppable. After her husband retired, they bought a sailboat and sailed to England, France, the Med, the Caribbean, and uh, back home. That's pretty unstoppable. That's pretty unstoppable. So we have a question too from somebody who is asking uh, what the status is of the CAS, CAF WASP documentary movie. And I just, I want to say we have um, several people who are, are very involved in the CAF Rise Above educational outreach program, which um, is very interconnected with the WASP squadron as well. So we have, have that a lot of those team members on the call today too. And I feel like that outreach program could, you know, be a whole other webinar, but um, I will speak to the status of the documentary and then I will, Greg Hallbrook, I will put you in touch with that group so that you can get all of your questions answered. But um, the film for the CAF Rise Above WASP um, was just finished and it was actually set to be on the road this year. It was a debut year and I think it went to one event in February in Tallahassee 
um, the new trailer, and then um, and then everything kind of got postponed and shut down. So I believe, and I will definitely be corrected immediately if I'm wrong, but I believe that they're going to try and, and release that film at Oshkosh, um, at EAA Air Venture at Oshkosh in July. Um, but it will not be released on a DVD. The, the film was especially made to be shown in a trailer, so it's a very immersive experience. But I'm, I'm going to look, because if I'm wrong, I will be able to get you that answer right away. I'm sure someone will let me know. Well, I know we've had a lot of frustration trying to get Nell Bright on the line, but we do have her story recorded and we'll see if we can't revisit the opportunity to chat with her. However, it's been such a pleasure, Elaine and Ellie, to have both of you on our webinar today. Thank you so much for all the time that you've spent getting prepared for this and sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. We continue with Thank our webinar series. Like, next was, week, it, next Wednesday at 3 p.m. Central Daylight Time, we have the D-Day pilot and the flight nurse with Steve Padone. So I hope you guys will tune in. That's going to be a great story, a love story, as well as a, 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 a virtual experience with what it was like to be a flight nurse and a D-Day pilot. So I hope you'll join us then. And again, thank you, ladies. It was a great pleasure. More than welcome.